Action Center, and I am not Jeffrey Rosen. <laughs> My name is Sheldon Gilbert. I'm Vice President and Senior Fellow here at the National Constitution Center, and I'm pinch hitting for Jeff Rosen, who wishes me to tell you that he's, uh, he's, he's so sad that he can't be here tonight. Uh, but he's very excited uh, that all of you joined us tonight, and we're so thrilled for the event and debate this evening. Um, before we begin today's program, we have a couple exciting new additions to our town hall programming that we want to make sure you're aware of. Uh, first, on November 28th, the National Constitution Center will host a national symposium featuring some of America's top thought leaders on what James Madison would make of the media, courts, Congress, and the presidency today. We have a, an all-star lineup of guests, uh, starting with Senator Chris Coons from uh, just around the corner in Delaware, uh, Jonah Goldberg of the National Review, Michelle Goldberg of the New York Times, a Pulitzer Prize, a Pulitzer Prize winning historian, Jack Rakove, and Jeffrey Goldberg, editor of The Atlantic, and a public reception will follow the event. So November 28th, if it's not already on your calendars, you definitely need to put this on your calendars. On December 17th, we will have our final town hall program of the season. Join us as America's leading scholars and federal judges participate in three panel discussions, exploring the evolution of judicial independence from the founding to today. This program is presented in partnership with the Federal Judicial Center and sponsored by John Aglialaro. For tickets and more information about our fall programs, visit Constitution Center dot org forward slash debate. Uh, and now I am thrilled to introduce tonight's program that's presented in partnership with both American Promise and the American Constitution Society. I'd like to thank both of them for their collaboration to address this critically important question, should we amend the Constitution to authorize political spending limits? That's the key question tonight, and in a moment you'll have an opportunity to vote to answer how you think that question ought to be answered at the beginning of the debate, and then we'll have you vote at the end of the debate to see if your views have changed by listening to the arguments on both sides of this question, should we amend the Constitution to authorize political spending limits. Our all-star cast this evening for the debate uh, includes Floyd Abrams, who is senior counsel in Cahill Gordon and Rindell LLP's litigation practice group. He's argued frequently in the U.S. Supreme Court. Most recently, Floyd prevailed in his argument before the Supreme Court on behalf of Senator Mitch McConnell as amicus curiae, defending the rights of corporations and unions to speak publicly about politics and elections in Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. He is the author of Friend of the Court on the Front Lines with the First Amendment and Speaking Freely, Trials of the First Amendment. Floyd Abrams, you want to join us? Floyd really is a constitutional rock star, and we're so delighted that he could join us tonight. Uh, next, we'll be joined by Jeff Clements, founder and president of American Promise. Jeff has practiced law for three decades in public service and private practice, and is the author of Corporations Are Not People, Reclaiming Democracy from Big Money and Global Corporations. Previously, Jeff has been a partner in a major Boston law firm and served as Assistant Attorney General and Chief of the Public Law Enforcement Bureau in the Attorney General's Office in Massachusetts. Jeff, come and join us. Next, we'll be joined by Elizabeth Doty, a former uh, fellow of Harvard University's Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics and founder of Leadership Momentum. She writes regularly for Strategy and Business Magazine on leadership, values, and integrity in business. Her book, The Compromise Trap, documented the challenges executives faced in trying to live their values and lead with integrity during the buildup to the financial crisis. Elizabeth, come on out. Next, we're so privileged to be joined by Bradley A. Smith, who holds the Josiah H. Blackmore II and Shirley M. Nott Professor of Law position at Capital University Law School and is chairman and founder of the Institute for Free Speech. 
He is one of the nation's leading authorities on election law and campaign finance and co-author of Voting Rights and Election Law, a leading casebook in the field. In 2000, he was nominated by President Clinton to the Federal Election Commission, where he served for five years, including as chairman of the commission in 2004. During the 2018 to 2019 academic year, Professor Smith will be a James Madison Program Fellow in the Department of Politics at Princeton University. Again, just a little bit, uh, a few miles from us. Uh, Bradley, come on out. And finally, uh, the, the last but definitely not the least, we are delighted to have with us tonight Chara Torres Spellacy, who is the Leroy Highbaugh Senior Research Chair and Professor of Law at Stetson University's School of Law. Professor Torres Spellacy was counsel in the democracy program of the Brennan Center for Justice at New York University School of Law, where she provided guidance on the issues of money in politics and the judiciary to state and federal lawmakers. She is the author of the book, Corporate Citizen, An Argument for the Separation of Corporation and State. Come on out, Chara. And with that, we're ready to begin our debate, which will feature what the National Constitution is so proud of the most, opportunities to disagree without being disagreeable. This is what makes the National Constitution Center unique. We'll turn, that, turn it over to our moderator for the evening. Good evening. My name is Chara Torres Spellacy, and I've been tasked with giving you a crash course in campaign finance in eight minutes. Here we go. <laughs> All right, so since we're at the National Constitution Center, I thought we should start with the text of the Constitution. The text of the Constitution, as uh, someone who has to teach it to uh, first years, is very frustrating in that it doesn't address a lot of modern problems. And money and politics is one of those modern problems that is not clearly addressed by the text. You can look in vain for the words campaign finance or the words money and politics in the text of the original Constitution, and you will not find it. And against that silence in the text, the Congress and the states have passed a series of campaign finance laws that try to address the issue of money and politics. Now, there are various ways that you can address money and politics through legislation. You can have contribution limits, expenditure limits, uh, disclosure, source bans. You can offer public financing to candidates. So there's also a long and rich tradition of challenging these campaign finance laws. And so when these cases get to the door of the Supreme Court, typically what the Supreme Court does when looking at a campaign finance law is they apply the First Amendment, which very much is in the Constitution. And they look at the law using the First Amendment as a source of analysis. So, and this is a gross oversimplification, but I don't have much time. Uh, when the court looks at expenditure limits, they typically look at freedom of speech. When the court is looking at contribution limits, they typically look at it as a freedom of association right. And because they are using the First Amendment, they typically use heightened scrutiny, either intermediate scrutiny or strict scrutiny. Now, I work on the issue of money and politics, and I'm very much on the reform side. And the reason that I'm on the reform side is my intuition that wealth is not a synonym for wisdom. Let me say that again. I am pretty sure that wealth is not a synonym for wisdom. And thus, I think it's reasonable to put in limits on money and politics so that wealth doesn't swamp our democracy. But um, reasonable minds can and do disagree about campaign finance. 
And if you come to this issue from the point of view that money is speech, then you'll probably end up closer to where the current Supreme Court has ended up, which is allowing more money into our political system. Now, there are two big cases that have led us to this point. One is Buckley versus Vallejo from the 1970s. Buckley holds that expenditure limits on individuals are unconstitutional. And then more recently, in Citizens United versus FEC, uh, the Supreme Court similarly held that expenditure limits as applied to corporations are similarly unconstitutional. And that puts uh, lawmakers in a bit of a bind if they want to impose certain expenditure limits on either individuals or corporations. If Congress woke up tomorrow and decided we really want to put limits on how much corporations can spend in American elections, they would not be able to do that under this Supreme Court's reading of this Constitution. And thus, the question of whether we should amend the Constitution to allow for such restrictions. And you can see the impact of Buckley and Citizens United in every American election, including the one that we just had. So we just had a midterm election, and it was the most expensive midterm election we have had in our history. So part of how you get to that inf big uh, uh, grand total is if you look at the Senate candidates and you add it to the House candidates and you look at what all federal candidates spent in 2018, it was $2 billion. And then on top of that, there was a lot of independent spending, outside groups who were not uh, affiliated with either a candidate or a political party. The outside groups spent an additional $1.3 billion. So for those of us who are concerned about money in politics, one of the things that we work on is the 28th Amendment, which do we have the text of the Udall Amendment? It'll get there eventually, I, I assure you. So the, um, the Udall Amendment has three basic components. One, it would allow for expenditure limits for individuals, so that would fix the Buckley problem. It would allow for expenditure limits for corporations, that would fix the Citizens United problem. And it also anticipates something that you're probably going to hear about tonight, which is a concern about this approach to amending the Constitution because it would be one of the first times that the First Amendment itself is being amended. And so the third part allows for preservation of freedom of the press. And we, we'll, we'll get into why that would be necessary and um, why this may not be enough for those who find uh, amending the Constitution in this way uh, more troubling. So, we're going to have some democracy in the hall. Uh, we are going to vote on the following question. Should we amend the US Constitution to allow for expenditure limits? So in order to vote, you go to www dot menti dot com, which is m e n t i dot com. You use code thirty five seventy three eighty one again in order to vote, and we're voting on whether we should amend the constitution to allow for expenditure limits. It's uh, www dot menti dot com, m e n t i dot com. 357381, uh, please vote now. And then we'll also vote at the end of the debate and we'll see if either side has moved any of you and in which direction. All right, well, I am very uh, pleased to turn this over to our able debaters. 
we're going to have um, a, a speaker for the amendment, then a speaker against the amendment, then a speaker for the amendment, then a speaker uh, against the amend amendment. And, in, and then after that period, we'll have some time for questions. I'll ask a few questions of our debaters, and I'll take a few questions from the audience as well. And then um, we will get the closing arguments from each of our debaters as well. And then at the very end, we will vote again, and we will see whether you have changed your minds. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our first debater, Elizabeth Doty, who is speaking in favor of amending the Constitution. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Great. Hello, and thank you to the National Constitution Center for hosting this debate on such an urgent and relevant issue, um, should we amend the Constitution to allow for political spending limits. As the only non-lawyer on the panel this evening, um, <laughs> I am honored to be here. Um, I'd like to offer mostly factual observations and some common sense logic as a citizen and as a business person, um, why I think this amendment is actually needed to secure equal rights of uh, participation in our political processes. So I may have to look at my notes a little bit, but here goes. I recently had a chance to view the Constitution, went to Washington as a tourist, and I think you'll agree with me if you've ever done that, that that's a very powerful experience. And I wonder, kind of, why is that? I'd like to invite you to think for just a moment. What is the promise that the Constitution <laughs> represents for you personally? Is it political equality? Freedom? Government of, by, and for the people? Whatever it is, it's amazing how much Americans deeply hold and share a lot of these values. But now I'd like to ask you to think again. We hold these values, but in opposition to what? What do those values need to be safeguarded against? Is it government of, by, and for the few? Oligarchy, plutocracy, government of the wealthy? I would offer that if there is one core American promise, it's that we're all created equal. That we all have an equal right to participate in our political processes, and that we have a right to equal representation. Yet this is not how things seem today very often, if you would agree. Uh, over the past several decades, Americans have lost a lot of faith in our democracy and the integrity of our government. 57% of Americans don't believe it matters if they vote because they see that politics and elections are controlled by people with money and big corporations. In 2016, outside political spending, outside of the, um, the parties, was 28 times the level it was in 2000. In 2012, it was only 20 times. There's a big increase. But it hasn't always been this way. From the time of Teddy Roosevelt, we have had reasonable limits on political spending. So Chara gave us an overview. This new era started back in 1976 with Buckley versus Vallejo. Uh, Vallejo. That was when the Supreme Court began applying a new theory to interpreting the First Amendment. And it culminated with Citizens United and a few others. We've now had several decades of data on this experiment, and we can see the impact it's had on our democracy. There are four central propositions to this new theory that was applied. I'd like to cover each briefly with a particular focus on the one I'm most familiar with dealing with corporations. And then my colleague Jeff will cover the others. The first proposition was that money is speech. The court argued that because money is necessary for speech, limiting money amounts to limiting free speech. However, as Jeff will outline, viewing money this way corrupts the idea of equal representation because it allows some to amplify their voices and drown out others in elections and in day-to-day -day governing. One absurd example, the average representative right now spends 30 to 70% of their time raising money. 30 to 70%. Anybody else did that, they'd get fired. <laughs> Secondly, the Supreme Court decided in 2010 that corporations of all types, including unions, nonprofits, trade associations, and for-profit companies, have a right to spend as much as they want to influence our political processes. The argument was that people should not be stripped of their rights just because they associate in corporate form. 
But a corporation, especially a for-profit company, is not an association of people. It's a legal entity chartered by a state government given certain advantages that make it a powerful tool for concentrating capital and pursuing economic gain. When we allow these to use their treasury funds to participate in political processes, we are licensing them to speak on behalf of shareholders who have not given their consent and undermining the ability of other citizens to be heard. But even more dangerous, unlimited political spending promotes crony capitalism and undermines long-term prosperity. In a strong economy, businesses compete based on the value they create in the marketplace. But under crony capitalism, companies compete by buying political influence. This is how we get a 79,000 page tax code, $100 billion a year in corporate subsidies, and rule changes that make it easier to market, market opioids. Dark money groups such as the U US Chamber, the Democratic Governors Association, and the Republican Governors Association allow companies to anonymously spend over a billion dollars to elect or defeat candidates. Then lobbyists leverage those contributions as favors that they can exchange for political access. The result is an incredibly destructive arms race where all businesses have to play to keep up. According to Matt Patsky, the CEO of Trillium Asset Management, he's saying, Fortune 500 companies have come to him saying that they're experiencing legalized extortion, that the politicians are coming to the companies and saying, here's how much we think you should contribute, given what your competitor has contributed. Clearly, the third proposition in this new theory, that independent political spending cannot cause corruption, doesn't hold up in practice. And finally, the fourth proposition is that political equality is not part of the First Amendment that we cannot level the playing field. What? Leveling the playing field is exactly what you want to do in the political arena, rather than having one team win because they bribed the referee. That's why we set time, time limits in town hall meetings, right? That's, please vote yes. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, where shall I start? Maybe I'll start w with the First Amendment. Uh, we've heard some language. We haven't heard the language uh, of the First Amendment. Uh, one of the things it says is this. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. No law. We've had the First Amendment and the rest of the Bill of Rights since 1791, the First Amendment has never been amended. Not when Nazis marched in Charlottesville, not when people stand outside churches and synagogues and defame dead American soldiers, not when flags are burned, not in a wide range of circumstances in which speech is loathsome dangerous, painful, and does very little benefit except the benefit of saying we're not going to trust the government to pick and choose what speech is allowed uh, and what not. So your choice tonight, your vote tonight, will be whether for the first time in American history, and it is the first time, the First Amendment, as interpreted by the Supreme Court, should be limited. There should be less in the way of free speech as defined uh, by the Supreme Court. Now, it seems to me we have just been through an election of a very different sort than was previously described. People participated actively, uh, vigorously, uh, people who contributed less than $200 came up in total with $1.4 billion in the country. That's people who contributed less than $200. Uh, these numbers are enormous. All these numbers are enormous. It's a big country. People spend a lot of money. Uh, we spent $9 billion on Halloween items. Uh, in the last uh, uh, October. 
uh, 9 billion. Uh, so uh, notwithstanding that the numbers are large, uh, we should, I think, accept the fact that they're large because we are large as a country. What's wrong as a policy matter, in my view, with uh, the amend amendment of the Constitution, they say, Who, who's going to decide what is a reasonable amount? Most of you live here in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania has already been through a situation where gerrymandering got to a point where we needed judges to step in and to say we will not, in effect, trust these legislators to make districts which are so disproportionate, so unfair, uh, that, that they don't represent the public. Uh, the question here is, shall we trust state and federal legislatures, state legislature and, and the Congress, to go and do what they think is best in this area? The core of the First Amendment, the core, is we don't trust them to do that. This is not something we allow to be voted on in legislatures one way or the other. There's something else here, and that is we deal here in an area in which people in power have enormous impetus to pass legislation limiting people out of power from talking. Uh, Justice Scalia, with whom, for whatever it's worth, I didn't agree a whole lot when he was on the bench, but he said something I thought was very persuasive in this area. He said, this is an area where even-handedness is not fairness. He said, if all elections were arranged so that no campaigning was allowed, it would have an enormous effect in favor of incumbents an enormous effect in favor of people in power. It is only because speech can be made, and a lot of speech, that we get to hear both sides. And this, in the end of the day, is, I think, what this is really about. I'm not arguing about whether speech is money, money is speech. What I do know is that this microphone was paid for, the lights are paid for, the hall is paid for, and if this were a political event, someone would be paying for it. And that speech, to be effective, has to be around the country as a whole. Where does that money go to? It's television ads, for the most part. It's television, and it's new media, social media, and the like. That's what gets out views. It gets out opinions. And so I would urge on you not to vote to amend, change uh, the Constitution, and to limit the First Amendment rights that we've had for so many years. Thank you. Thank you. Now speaking in favor is Jeff Clements. Thank you, Chara, and hello, everyone. Um, I am here to disagree in many ways with my friend Floyd, uh, and most of all, with what this is about. We are not amending the First Amendment. This proposal for a 28th Amendment to the Uni United States Constitution is to save the First Amendment. It has been radically transformed, and I'd like to walk through a few reasons why. But this constitutional amendment will not only save the First Amendment by putting back political equality and anti-corruption principles so we all have First Amendment free speech rights, but it will save American democracy from the fate that the founders most feared when they met here in Philadelphia two centuries ago, the collapse of Republican government into oligarchy, government of a wealthy class. $50 billion has been spent since the Citizens United decision in 2010. Yeah, people pay a lot of money for potato chips and Halloween items. They do it a lot of small amounts at a time. It's not just concentrated among a large donor class that dominates it. But election spending is different. Less than 1% of Americans make up most of the money in the political system. Uh, you know, three billionaires just three, three people spent $200 million in the 2016 election. 11 billionaires have put a billion dollars into super PACs. 
And so the problem is the money is concentrated. What does that have to do with the First Amendment? Well, if it's free speech and we can't touch it, it we are only at the beginning of a systemic collapse of Republican government. And don't take it from me, Republican Congressman Jim Leach from Iowa, former Republican Congressman, says the Supreme Court with this interpretation of the First Amendment has, quote, genetically modified our democratic DNA, pushing us towards corporatism and oligarchy. So here's how the modification happened. Here's why the First Amendment has already been destroyed if we don't rescue it. First, political equality was taken out of the amendment, of the First Amendment. Under this new theory, your equal rights do not matter in the balance of whether money can be limited in politics. Second, anti-corruption was to find a way to not be a factor. First, political equality. They say, and I've heard Floyd say many times, and he's quoting accurately from the Supreme Court, that a level playing field, that equality is wholly foreign to the First Amendment. No, it is not wholly foreign. It's central to the First Amendment. My right to have free speech and your right to have free speech is because we're both equal citizens. And I'm not allowed to shout you down because you have an equal right to free speech as well. So we hear a lot about, you know, we have to tolerate a really a lot of bad speech, and we sure do, and I'm a First Amendment lawyer too. I am an absolutist for free speech. I know we have to put up with Nazi speech and all kinds of horrible speech. This proves the equality point. This proves the mistake of pretending that our equal rights don't matter. Our right to speak our mind and march no matter what we're gonna say is it because we're equal citizens, so even Nazis get to speak. But imagine if Skokie, Illinois, that had to, there's a big case where the Nazis had to, got to march through Skokie, what if they gave their permits out to march based on a bidding process? What if they said you can march as long as you bid against other people who also want to march, and whoever pays the most gets to march? We wouldn't stand for that. Why? Because the First Amendment guarantees equality. So there's an equal right to speak in the First Amendment. So what the court has done, we don't tolerate that in the public square, equal rights, but in election money, suddenly we're not allowed to talk about equality. So the court's removal of equality from the First Amendment is the most efficient, most effective way to rapidly allocate political power based on wealth in this country, and that's exactly what's happened. The second modification they did was pull out anti-corruption. They say independent expenditures, super PACs, it won't corrupt. Well, that's, nobody really believes it, and if you talk to any politician, they'll sure tell you it sure does corrupt. The fact that money is supposedly independent, the politicians, the candidates know the power of these super PACs, of the so-called independent money, whether it's corporations, wealthy, or unions. It has power, and so that's why we have massive spending uh, by fossil fuel corporations amidst the global climate catastrophe, and our Washington politicians aren't even discussing it. Is that more speech? or is that less speech? Is that more debate, more ideas, or is it less? It's less because they are terrified to talk about it. $21 trillion in national debt, another existential crisis on our country's future. And what do the politicians do as soon as they get there, after being elected by this kind of money? Massive tax cuts for corporations and billionaires when we have a $21 trillion debt. Gun violence, opioids, infrastructure collapse, and we are paralyzed because our politicians are paralyzed. We need to rescue the First Amendment. We need to rescue our politicians so that we can have more debate, more ideas, and more solutions. So incumbents, incumbents have a huge advantage in this system. We want more competition in, in our politics, more challenging of incumbents. We have to have an amendment to limit the money in politics because the politicians who are incumbents are the ones who get to write the rules to reward the donors. Most PAC money, most of it, according to the Center for Responsive Politics, goes to incumbents. Did you know 40% of legislative races nationally now have no competition? One person is running. You don't have a choice. 40% of our races, and that's usually the incumbent. So what about the press? Look at section three, if we bring the amend amendment back up here. It preserves freedom of the press. There's, let's read the First Amendment, as Floyd suggests. Freedom of speech and of the press, two different concepts. We had years of corporate limit, money on corporations being limited, a century of it. Plenty of corporate press. Floyd represented them famously, one of them the New York Times Corporation. 
That has nothing to do with whether corporations, union, unions, and billionaires can buy our politicians in our political process. End time. <laughs> so please vote yes to support this constitutional amendment. Next, speaking against the amendment, is Professor Bradley Smith. Well, thank you, thank you all for coming. Floyd and I get the easy part. We just have to cover the spread, which as near as I can tell, looks like it's about 50 or 60 points. So <laughs> we get a good deal going here. Um, let's talk about this a, a, a little bit. Is Buckley new? You know, some people we've heard new, this new theory, this new theory. It's not really a new theory. Uh, Prior to 1974, a lot of people don't realize this, prior to 1974, there were basically no campaign finance regulations in this country. We elected Roosevelt and Eisenhower and Truman and all these other incompetents using a system of essentially unregulated spending. There were some laws on the books, but not many, and they didn't do much. Today, we live in a very highly regulated system. It's more regulated than at any time in our country's history prior to 1974. Uh, and more regulated in, in some ways than at any time in our history, even though in certain ways it has been liberalized in recent years. Now, uh, why has this come about? Because in 74, Congress first passed the Federal Election Campaign Act amendments that really had some bite, and that was the first time these things were really challenged in, in Buckley v. Vallejo, which we've heard about. Now, we get the sense, you know, Floyd has mentioned, you know, who do you want to decide? And, and our worthy opponents here have suggested, we've got to decide, we the people. This amendment does not empower you, the people. It empowers politicians. Notice how it's even addressed. They call it outside spending. What is outside spending? That's spending by people who are not the candidates. That's spending by us, in other words. That's spending by you, if you're a member of any kind of group that engages in political discussion. Now, we know how this can actually work out because we saw what happened in 1974. What did Congress pass? Congress passed a law saying that a group such as the NAACP or the Natural Resources Defense Council or the Chamber of Commerce or Right to Life or the NRA or Narrow Pro-Choice, whatever group you can think of, and you have gotta be a member of some of those groups, right? Or at least be a fellow traveler, could not spend more than $1,000 to discuss anything quote, relative to a candidate for political office. So if you are upset about something that Donald Trump has done, and you join some group, maybe the ACLU, or maybe it was your union, or who knows what group, and you said, I'd like to criticize this action by Mr. Trump, that would be commentary relative to a candidate, and it would be limited to $1,000 nationwide per year. What do you think? Pretty good deal? There's not going to be any speech. Who's going to publicize these things? Who's going to talk about these things? It's not going to happen. That's what Congress actually does. And we don't have to hypothesize that it's all puppies and rainbows because we know that that's what Congress does. Citizens United decision many people are very, very upset about. But most people don't really know too much actually about Citizens United. Citizens United is another group. People give it money. Why do they give it money? They give it money to voice their political views. And Citizens United made a documentary movie about Hillary Clinton. Actually, they first made a documentary movie about John Kerry trying to answer the documentary movie Fahrenheit 911 that some of you may remember by Michael Moore. And the FEC, which I was on at the time, said, well, we're not gonna let you do that. Because Michael Moore is a real filmmaker, but we don't think you guys are real filmmakers. What do you think? Should the government license films in that way? Maybe it should. That's what my opponents want to authorize through the First Amendment or through their amendment to the First Amendment. Now, what happened actually with Citizens United, right? Well, they went and started making all kinds of films and they entered them in film contests. They won prizes, they won awards, and four years later they came back, they said, we wanna run a documentary movie called about Hillary Clinton, a major candidate for president of the United States. And the FEC said, no, we don't think you can do that. Think about that. Now, if the New York Times, which is going to be exempt from all this, wants to run an editorial the day before election day, seen by a couple million people, it's absolutely fine. If a little group like Citizens United, which has a small fraction of the resources of the New York Times, wants to run an editorial, they would say, no, can't be done, because that's what the law was. So that's what I would emphasize. We don't need to pretend that we're gonna wonder what's going to happen if this amendment passes. We know it has happened before. Right? 
And it has happened other times. If you want to go way, way back, you can talk about the Alien and Sedition Acts and so on. Politicians want to do this kind of thing. They want to cut back criticism. Now, there's one thing I'm sure that every Democrat in this room can agree on. If there is anybody that would have been competent to make these kinds of decisions, it would have been the Republican Congress of the last two years. And if there's any person that has the proper disposition and calmness and rationality and intelligence to guide us in that, it's Donald Trump. And for those of you in the room who are Republicans, you might ask yourself, yes, and there's one other person as well that I would name, Nancy Pelosi. She is certainly the person we should put in charge of who gets to say how much and how often they get to say it. So what I would suggest to you is this is not, as I say, something that's going to empower the people. This is something that's going to empower the politicians. That's what they're asking you to do. They're saying, give us authority so we can regulate your speech because people are saying nasty things about us and revealing the things we do that we don't like. And we would like to limit groups like the NAACP to spending no more than $1,000 relative to, relative to candidate for office. What we're doing tonight is relative to candidates for office. It's almost everything that goes on. And so when we think about that, I think we'll agree with Floyd and Floyd's comments at the outset that this is exactly what the First Amendment was intended to prevent. This is why we have a First Amendment, right? So that all of us can speak whenever we need to speak about the issues that we think are dear to us. And if we think democracy and is truly threatened, <laughs> if we think democracy is truly threatened, right, then we want to spend our money to voice that opinion. Um, so there were supposed to be moderator questions, but we're getting a little short on time, and I like your questions better, so I'm gonna do four audience questions, uh, two to each side. Um, first to the proponents. How would your amendment deal with a wealthy person buying a newspaper, a TV station, or radio station to avoid campaign finance limits? So maybe I'll take that first. Um, and you know, first, let me just say one thing quickly about Brad's point about nonprofits. It's not a question of whether the people who are in nonprofits can speak or not. It's whether they can misuse a nonprofit corporation as a political front group to spend partisan money. There's, if you want to do that, form a ballot committee, combine, co comply with the rules, disclose, and compl comply with the limits. Perfectly fine. Just respect other people's rights who are participating in the process to don't misuse nonprofits. Similarly with the press, and I'm going to now get to this question. These are different categories of things, and we as citizens, and Congress, and the Supreme Court, and all of the people who aren't going away can continue to look at these categories. It's never one answer. What we're trying to do is get political equality and anti-corruption back into the Constitution so that when somebody, when we have to deal with the press issue, our billionaire is going to start buying Newspapers, well, Jeff Bezos already did um, in, in the Washington Post. Amazon is, owns the Washington Post. Um, I think we often have a question, is the media too concentrated? Are there not enough viewpoints? And we have tools to deal with that. That's a separate issue. And you know, does, is the press a more useful vehicle for propounding political expression in the midst of campaigns because you can do editorials? Yes, that's the point. You know, is, is, does that mean we should turn our, our democracy over to corporations and billionaires because we're afraid of how do we figure out the difference between freedom of press and freedom of speech? No, we can handle these problems. And you know, I do expect billionaires and corporations to buy and own the press. That's the way it works. That does not mean that ExxonMobil should suddenly be buying politicians and elections. Those are not the same thing. We can handle that kind of, as citizens governing ourselves, and, and checking Congress, we can handle those questions as we go forward with a stronger foundation of a First Amendment with this 28th Amendment. Okay. Uh, for Floyd Abrams, in retrospect, is there anything, and anything is in capital letters and underlined, about the Citizens United ruling that you would like to see modified or changed? Anything. <laughs> No, uh, let me tell you why. Uh, I, I was struck by thinking of what Jeff was saying a moment ago when he used the word misuse. 
about Citizens United. Citizens United is a conservative group uh, which put out a film that now I have to be personal. Uh, I admire, I voted for Hillary Clinton. I think this film was awful, unfair, unjust, harmful to the truth. I wouldn't think for a moment that you could make it a crime to put this film on television within 60 days of an election. That's what the McCain-Feingold bill did. That's what the law was under what my friends here would, would have it be. They made it a crime to put on, a, on television, cable, or satellite within 60 days of an election or 30 days of a convention. Uh, that very film. One more thought about Citizens United. Uh, the Citizens United case shows something else, which is that this third clause that was up here, protecting freedom of the press, is illusory. What is the press? The Federal Election Commission initially said, well, these people make movies, they're not the press, so they don't get First Amendment protection. You know what happened after the Supreme Court ruled? The Federal Election Commission said, well, after all, it is the press. Now, these are government people. They're not bad people, and they're not all political people, but, but these are people enforcing what they think the law is. There's not much difference between freedom of speech and freedom of the press, and what we're talking about tonight and what Citizens United, for all the criticism of it, protects is the freedom to have more rather than less political speech. Okay, perfect timing. Um, to the proponents, how can we allay people's fear of a constitutional convention? I have to, I, okay. being the non-lawyer, I have to. <laughs> the lawyer, I yeah. So the Article 5 is how we amend the Constitution. Um, we have done 27 amendments so far. It's how we got the Bill of Rights. It's, it's why women vote. It's why we elect senators. It's why there's presidential term limits. 27 amendments, and other than the one up the street, <laughs> 231 years ago, we have never had a convention. That's a lay fear number one. Is it likely that we're going to now? No. All those other amendments were hard. All of them had turbulent issues going on. We've never had a constitutional convention, and the fears about it are what would happen at the convention. It might run away, it might do other amendments that nobody wanted, who knows? But we don't need to worry about that fear because the Article 5 other way amendment is, has been proposed and are proposed is by two-thirds of Congress proposing the amendment. It then goes through a ratification pathway of 38 states. So that is the pathway I would expect that we will see with this amendment for the same reasons we saw it with all the other amendments. So if you're concerned about a convention, that's, there's, you know, arguments on pros and cons about whether pushing a convention either scares Congress into doing it or otherwise is helpful, arguments against that. Um, but the substance of whether we need this amendment has nothing to do with the convention and the surest way to allay fear of any convention proposal is to get Congress um, 67 senators, 290 House votes, and get the amendment out to the states for ratification by the people in the states. Okay, uh, Professor Smith, if there are limits to speech, like uh, shouting fire in a theater, why not allow for limits on money in politics? Sure, um, of course you are allowed to shout fire in a theater if the theater is on fire. Uh, it's probably encouraged, and, and we might think about that as being a relevant thing. Again, I hear all the time these days, people say our democracy is under threat like never before. And some people are saying, but you can't shout fire, at least not if you want to spend more than $1,000 to do so under the uh, you know, 1974 Act, right? So this is not a town meeting. You know, Jeff has made a number of comments in which he's kind of suggested that somehow if Tom Steyer speaks, other people are being silenced. But that's not true. The silence comes when they say, Tom Steyer can't speak anymore. That's silencing speech. 
So we have different rules in different types of places, right? And we have rules for something like this because we have a set time and place. But when we talk about politics, we have lots of time to be out there talking about politics. There's no limit really on what can be published anymore, what can be said, what can be written out. And we listen to lots of different voices and, and we hear lots of different opinions. And where we're all equal then is when we listen to those opinions, when we have a right to speak them to the best of our ability, and most importantly, when we go to vote. Okay. Floyd, your closing argument. Two minutes. Standing or sitting? Whatever you'd like. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I can even do it in less. I just want to deal with two issues. One is one of the big differences between the sides here tonight is this. Uh, Brad and I are talking about the risks of government control the risks of government involvement, the dangers of government decision-making. Uh, who's who's going to decide? How much is enough speech? Uh, the, the language of that amendment that was up here earlier talked about reasonable limitations. Uh, who's going to make that, that decision? Whoever it is, it is the government, and it is the, the government that the First Amendment is about. I mean, our friends on the other side haven't said a word yet about the dangers of government involvement, control, oversight uh, of speech or press. Uh, but that, that is the core of the First Amendment. That's why it says Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Congress they were talking about. And Congress as the government. Finally, uh, a word about equality. Nothing has benefited the cause of equality more in this country than freedom of speech. It is because people and entities and organizations and partnerships and yes, even corporations have spoken out about the lack of equality which is a major problem of this country, that we have moved forward, at least to a considerable extent, uh, in trying to deal with the problems of inequality. When you lessen speech, when you ration speech, and that's what this is about, when you ration speech, you harm the cause of equality, not further it. Thank you. Perfect. Uh <laughs> Speaking in, in favor of the amendment, uh, Ms. Doty. So thank you. You've heard our uh, opponents argue that unlimited political spending is really about limiting us from speaking, and that if we love free speech, we have to accept money's domination of the political process. And don't worry, people will continue to participate even though they're disgusted with the process and have the lowest trust levels in years in our institution institutions. But rather than arguing from these conceptual frameworks, let's look back at the reality of what this much money has done. And I would like to focus in particular on the aspect of allowing corporations unlimited spending. Here's the bottom line on that in my view, that this is a lose, lose, lose proposition. You might think we need to allow corporations unlimited spending to make an argument for pro-business logic or to support the economy but it doesn't help the economy. There's not even that from it. It creates an unhealthy symbiotic relationship between government and special interests. And this is where a lot of this money is coming from, from everything we can tell. The special interests that distort our democracy also damage the real drivers of American innovation and long-term prosperity. It was Milton Friedman himself who warned about the dangers of corporations exerting influence on government, causing government to pick winners and losers. We need separation between economic processes and civic processes. Most CEOs want to win by creating value in the marketplace, but they can't do that if a competitor can game the system or pay off the referee. Nobody benefits if we allow this kind of blurring. And what we've created is a system that is unha un unsuitable for everyone. John Kerry called it corruption of the system that no one wants to participate in. 
So, as the only non-lawyer on the stage, I would ask us to look at something other than the legal concepts and look at the day-to-day -day experience of trust in this country. This amendment allows everyday citizens to take action, to direct the government, based on the first three causes in the preamble to the amendment, to allow them equal access to representation. Those airwaves, those are auctioned off, the TV airwaves, those are auctioned off in a financial process. The reason they're expensive is because there are lots of people trying to buy that time. And Tom Steyer can afford it more than time. us. <laughs> Thank you. Professor Smith. Okay. Um, First, I want to just at least very briefly address this idea again of, of equality. And, 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 you know, again, the question is do we want the government to be making those decisions as to who has spoken too much and who's not been heard enough? And of course, that's exactly what the First Amendment doesn't trust the government to do. But I want to note that the famous line that was quoted earlier, that the concept that you may limit the speech of some in order to enhance the speech of others is wholly foreign to the First Amendment, that was an eight to one decision by the Supreme Court. That was supported by justices such as Justice Brennan and, and Justice Thurgood Marshall, uh, and Justice Blackman, so on. This was not a controversial uh, point of view. Um, I, I find it interesting, you know, we, Jeff said, well, this is not about nonprofits, it's about front groups. <laughs> it is. The NAACP, the ACLU, Planned Parenthood, the National Rifle Association, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Realtors, these are front groups? These are front groups? That's what we're talking about? The ACLU? Okay. It's, if that's the theory, it doesn't surprise me that ever since the 1974 Federal Election Campaign Act, trust in government has gone steadily down. We're talked about trust in government. It's gone down, down, down. I want to close with just a brief quote. This is from another liberal icon, Justice Douglas, in an early 1950s case in which the government was trying to sue the labor unions to keep them from speaking, uh, communicating to their own members as political communications. And he wrote, under our Constitution, it is we the people who are sovereign. The people have the final say. It is therefore important, vitally important, that all channels of communication be open to them during every election, that no point of view be restrained or barred, and that people have access to the views of every group in the community. The most complete exercise of First Amendment rights is essential to the full, fair, and untrammeled operation of the electoral process. To the extent they are curtailed, the electorate is deprived of information, knowledge, and the opinion vital to its function. I would hope that you would recognize the threat of this kind of amendment which comes dressed as puppies and rainbows, but is really about Donald Trump or Nancy Pelosi or pick your political villain deciding who gets to speak more. Thank you. All right, and to close us out, Jeff Lentz. So vote yes for the constitutional amendment. We need to put people back in control of our government. You know, if the, we're here in a nonprofit corporations' facilities, if they suddenly decided to make this the political headquarters for a candidate, yes, that's misuse of the nonprofit corporation. It's not what it's made for. So let's, not, let's be clear, there are lots of ways to speak and lots of ways to get involved. Abusing the nonprofit laws isn't one of them. So our politicians are spending way too much time raising money. Our First Amendment freedoms to speak, petition, and hear diverse views are actually being limited and destroyed by the deployment of concentrated, often secret, and massive amounts of money. Do we really think we're hearing more ideas now than if before the billionaires and corporations and unions started dominating the money? This reckless experiment has failed. Money to influence elections has some relationship to speech, but is much closer to power and much more likely to corrupt. Um, so the Supreme Court isn't going to fix it. Only we can fix it with an amendment. And this amendment will enable a lot more debate. It will protect freedom of the press. It will guard against foreign money and foreign uh, disruption of our elections. It will enable us to come together. Remember, we need two-thirds of Congress and, and three-quarters of the states. We will do this together or not at all. It will heal our dangerous hyper-divisions, and we can do this. We've done it 27 times before. And yes, the First Amendment is stronger because we amend it. The reason it applies to states only because, even though it says Congress, 14th Amendment. The reason women can be active speakers in the political process, the 19th Amendment, right to vote. This is how we make it stronger. So now it's our turn. Let me say something about this trust in government, though. 
Government is going to make life and death decisions for you and you and you, for all of us. War, environment, energy, whether to build flood control. This is stuff that will lead to the deaths or li lives of Americans, depending on what we get, whether we get it right or not. And That's I why <laughs> Americans need to be at the table when those decisions are made, and we can't have the process be bought off. It's life or death. Please vote yes for this constitutional amendment. All right. So I know we are at time, but I would encourage you, please vote. I am just dying to know whether we have uh, changed anyone's mind and in which direction. So go to www.menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. The code is 357381. Please vote now. And so I would like to Thank you all for being here on behalf of the American Constitution Society, American Promise, and the National uh, Constitution Center. Uh -huh. <laughs> it looks like amending is winning. <laughs> so thank you so much for being here tonight. Have a pleasant evening. Oh, I don't know. How do we know the change? Oh. <laughs>